There's six of them. Good heavens, the cat's out of the bag. Tonight on our century, some foreign creatures that have given us no comfort. A kitten is a playful thing. Take a look at this lot. There's a basket full of tricks. These feline show ponies from the 1930s may look cuddly enough, but when they go bush, they go bad. This ugly Hawaiian seemed like a scientific solution to a problem. This water buffalo just seemed like a good idea. The rabbit seemed like a bit of fun at the time. And the prickly pear started as a pot plant and nearly became the pest of our century. It's a sad and a sorry story. Imported animals and fish and pets have become the pests of today. And it's pretty much the same with a lot of the plants that were brought in from overseas as well. This big island of ours, cut off from the rest of the world, has given us wonderful, unique wildlife. I mean, take the platypus, how special is that? Yet we've discovered this century that it's not nice to mess around with Mother Nature. We've discovered that many of the environmental disasters we face, we've caused ourselves. Public enemy number one, a foe whose battalions are thousands of millions strong despite unceasing slaughter. It's the late 40s, Germany, Italy and Japan have been beaten. But we go to war again, against a different invader, the European rabbit. The Australian countryside is being torn to bits by this environmental menace. And we have no one to blame but ourselves. In gullies, burrows cause more damage. Rainwaters flood them, they collapse and the precious topsoil is washed away. It is a grim fact that the rabbit was originally imported to Australia from England to provide sport for gentlemen. It all began at places like this property in Geelong. In 1859, 24 rabbits were brought here from England. The idea was to improve the local hunting. 90 years later, as this home movie shows, farmers were desperate. They staged rabbit drives, herding the beasts into fenced-off pens and beating them to death. At this drive in 1948, more than 5,000 rabbits were killed in just one afternoon. It wasn't until 1951 that scientists found a better, although hardly humane, solution. That's when Australian researchers began injecting the killer virus, myxomatosis. But the tough little bunny bounced back. Within a few years, the rabbit's immune system began adapting to the virus, and their numbers were back up again. A multiplication. That's the name of the game. Youngsters bring rabbits to Melbourne Zoo as Victoria proclaims an act making Br'er rabbits a prohibited pet. The penalty for having one is 50 pounds or six months jail. A multiplication. That's the name of the game. Hear me talking to your mother nature. The clever girl, she relies on habit. You take two hair with no care. Pretty soon you got a room for the rabbits. Farmers pulled out all the stops. Poisoning, fumigating, dynamiting their burrows. They even hunted them again with dogs. Only this time, it wasn't for sport. Multiplication. But when a female can have as many as five litters in one year, we've had to accept that the European rabbit is now part of the Australian landscape. The 
They're just about as common as cockroaches. Every summer, Queenslanders, and especially those in the far north, come foot to face with these toothless amphibians. They were brought in from Hawaii in 1932 to eat this, the cane grub. The grub had been making a feast of North Queensland's staple sugar industry for years. Once they'd matured, the grubs turned into beetles, which also ate the cane. It's a back-breaking job, and only the fittest may find a place in the team. Sugar had long pumped the economic muscle in North Queensland, and raw bone cane cutters had become working class heroes. Splendid specimens, these of typical suntanned Australian manhood at its best. Times were tough thanks to the Great Depression, but they'd worked too long and too hard to quit just because of a grub. Like the rabbit, the cane toad turned out to be one of nature's breeding machines. A female could lay an astonishing 40,000 eggs every summer. Now, as if that wasn't enough, farmers were horrified to discover that the cane toad's life cycle was out of whack with the grubs and the beetles. They were never around at the same time. The unnatural enemy of the grub turns out to be a killer pesticide developed in 1945. But by then, we were stuck with the toad. And there were billions of them. And there was more bad news. These sacks at the toad's side contain a toxic poison. Now that makes them really unfriendly. This plague of toads is like some gigantic vacuum cleaner devouring our precious wildlife. The hungrier beasts even ate ping pong balls. And their poison sacks make them deadly to any bigger animals that try to eat the toads. Kookaburras fell dead from the trees after just one bite. It's no wonder that cane toad squashing is all the go up north. But don't laugh. Each year, it hops further south and west. Like the rabbit, we're stuck with it for keeps. They kick-started our first settlement and became one of our greatest industries. But the millions of beef and dairy cattle that we unloaded across the land also unloaded something else. Too big for our native insects to break down, the cowpat just sat there, cooking in the noonday sun. It was the perfect incubator for blowflies. Blowies that became part of the great outdoors. And with it, the great Aussie salute. I'm just a lonely boy on the prairie Swinging in the saddle all day Cattle strand here, cattle strand there Oh, that's how I draw my pay Of course, by the swinging 60s, everyone should have known that if you want help, you get the Beatles. Not from Liverpool, but from South Africa. The South African dung beetle is a tiny insect that cleans up after the big animals of Africa. They hit the ground in 1968, rocking and rolling. The South African dung beetles made mincemeat of the Aussie cow cakes. And before we could say Louis the fly, the plague of blowies was history. But like other invaders, cattle brought other problems. This delicate land of ours had only been used to the gentle touch of our native animals. Mother Nature didn't make Australia for the heavy duty pounding dished out by imported cattle with hooves. Their bovine bother boots tore up the countryside and they weren't alone. Horses are still frequently used, but tractors are becoming popular, particularly on the larger farms. When Aussie farms started switching to machinery from the 1930s on, thousands of horses were turned loose to hit the bush and breed, and cause even more damage. And now we have one of the largest Brumby populations in the world. So big, there's been only one answer. Tally-ho, 
the dogs are on the scent and the wild pigs dash for cover. Feral pigs are another foreign devil that ripped into sheep and lambs and our landscape. This old film shows hunters with dogs trained to bring the highly aggressive porkers to ground without hurting the pigs so they could be sold later. It was dangerous and sometimes deadly, especially if you're a dog. It's easy to see how they kill lambs. How would you like a rip from that tub? But hold the phones. This wins the prize for the most unwelcome invader. Your average domestic pussy can kill 32 native animals and birds every year. Without any of its normal predators to contain it, feral cats roam the Australian bush at will. But it wasn't only the animals we brought in that caused chaos. This is the story of the greatest plant invasion the world has ever known. Holding in its spiny grip a vast area of pastoral and agricultural land, spreading at the rate of one million acres a year. The South American cactus, or prickly pear, sailed here with Captain Philip and the first fleet. The prickly pear was food for the tiny cochineal bugs. The bugs were squashed down to make the dye for the British soldiers' redcoats. With no natural enemy, the prickly pear raids through the bush. By the early part of our century, it had spread like a blister over 16 million acres of Queensland and into New South Wales. Here we have the velvety tree pear, which forms impenetrable scrubs in parts of central Queensland. Many of these plants are 30 feet high. As mountains of cactus piled up, families went broke because this prickly weed grew faster than farmers could hack it down. The answer was a tiny insect with a big name, Cactoblastus cactorium, the hungry moth larvae from South America. These eggs are being weighed in order to ascertain the number. There are five million eggs in this day's collection. You doubt me? Well, <laughs> count them. Way back in 1925, Moth eggs were sent out to farmers. They watched in amazement as the moths munched their way through the pear, just as they'd done on the other side of the Pacific, where they'd kept the prickly pear under control. It was a breakthrough for Aussie science. Within two years, farming land that had been useless was ready to go once again. And it was another reminder that just because it'll grow here doesn't mean that it belongs here. Taylor family of Melbourne wondered why the cornice on their fireplace in their housing commission home kept making funny noises. They gave it to the boffins at the forestry commission who had to listen with their special microphones. And there it was again. A few digs with a knife and the invader showed its face. It was the European house borer, chomping its way through the cornice and ready to start on the rest of the Taylor's house. The borer had snuck into Australia in the late 1940s in prefabricated houses imported from Europe. These were meant to ease the housing crisis that hit after World War II. The borer was a prime pest. They could hide away, munching, for up to 11 years. The only sign that everything inside had been cleaned out was a small hole. Welcome to Australia, to your new home. Welcome you people from the old land. From pests to people. In the 1950s and 60s, new Australians rode in on the big immigration wave. They came mostly from Britain and from post-war Europe. Ever so far away, isn't it, John? Oh, not so very far these days, dear. And they all wanted to bring just a little memento. Maybe just some clippings from the old country garden for the new backyard. Nothing to declare. But getting through Aussie immigration was close to the third degree. Now, we had some of the strictest quarantine regulations in the world. In spite of our past mistakes, we'd been pretty lucky. Sorry, you can't bring those in. Our land had escaped most of the plant and the animal pests that had long plagued the rest of the world. The trick was to keep it that way. 
And you, Tony. It's too bad. We'd like to let you have those vines growing in Australia, but it can't be done. And they only the third Maria. Que peccato. Oh, Tony, that is too bad. If it breathed, then spray it. That was our policy. Pesticides, invented in the 1940s, were all the go. When in doubt, spray it again. To kill off our old friend, the European house borer, we wrapped up the whole house. And sometimes the whole street. And then we gave it a good dose of chemicals. The star gets sprayed with DDT to keep away the fly. We even sprayed Maureen O'Hara when the Hollywood star showed up to make a movie in South Australia in 1952. Now these overseas chemicals were also just the job for fighting long-standing Aussie pests like the grasshopper. When scientists discovered a huge colony of grasshopper eggs along the banks of the Murray River, they predicted disaster with fears that a plague of insects would wipe out the Victorian wheat crop. There was no time to muck about, so they called in the RAAF. Using Beaufort bombers, they took to the skies with their new chemical answer to every problem. In each case, a radio truck moved on to the threatened farm. Communication with the pilot was established, and the ground crew set out the smoke signals which marked the section of crop to be dealt with at each run. With military precision just 50 feet above the deck, the bombers strafe the grasshoppers and save the crops. But in a way, it was too successful. Eventually we realised that our passion for pesticides could do as much harm as good. All these chemicals killed off the good bugs as well as the pests. We had to get the balance right. Our century has seen all kinds of invaders ravage our country. But by far the worst has been us. Gee whiz. There's more than 3,000 acres here. And it's all ours in the oldest jungle in the world. We'll be hearing the sound of our axes soon biting into all this timber. It's great land, Kathy. If only we can tame it. We didn't tame the land. It was more like rape, plunder and pillage. In our rush to settle the country, we blitzed almost half of Australia's native forests and more than two-thirds of our native vegetation. Our wildlife had suffered even more, like the Tasmanian tiger, shot and poisoned out of existence. This last Tasmanian died in the Hope Art Zoo in 1934. And for a time, early in our century, it seemed that the cuddly koala was also doomed. By cutting down the eucalypts, it meant the koalas lost their food and their shelter from native and other predators. 1919 was not a good year for the koala. We slaughtered one million of them and turned them into fur coats and hat linings. One year later, only 500 of these magical marsupials were left. And we were slow to learn, by the 1980s, we were starting to wake up, that we had to put back some of what we'd ripped out. Tree planting on a massive scale began all over the country. By 1998, 700 million trees had been planted. With luck, Blinky Bill will see in the new century with every other true blue Australian. In our century, we've seen insects reaching plague proportions and others that have worked miracles. We've seen pigs and goats and buffaloes and camels, Indian minor birds, you name it, all playing havoc with this wide brown land of ours. And as you've seen, we've tried everything to get rid of them. But for at least one invader, we've found a great use. I'm talking about the old Akubra hat. We're told that it takes 14 rabbits to make a hat like this one. Perhaps we should follow the old adage, the old saying that if you want to get ahead, 
get ahead. In search of a most unwelcome visitor, the Argentine ant. memories and images of the past 100 years, be sure to get your copy of the Our Century book, available wherever good books are sold. <laughs>